soon as we have a green light, we'll start. As soon as member Brindle, Brindle's ready. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Tuesday, May 1st, 2018 meeting of the Edina City Council. Roll call, please. Ms. Mangan. Member Brindle. Here. Member Staunton. Here. Member Stewart. Here. Mayor Hovland. Here. Uh, we have in front of us this evening a form of meeting agenda. Is there anyone who wishes to modify the agenda? I've got one addition to... Um, Six, uh, section six, which is special recognitions and presentations. Uh, please add uh, item six D, which is a proclamation for Palmer Roxwold, who mm. turned 102 yesterday, a resident of our community. We'll talk a little bit about Palmer. Uh, with that uh, addition to the um, agenda, is there a motion to adopt the uh, agenda in its modified form? So moved. Second. Second. Get a motion and second to adopt the amended agenda. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Carried. Uh, next up is community comment. Is there anyone in the council or uh, chambers that wishes to address the city council with regard to a matter of concern to them that's not otherwise on the agenda this evening? Good evening. Good evening. Come on up and um, do you need do you need the um, do you need the center console for anything? Otherwise, we can use a side podium. And I don't think we currently need the center console. All right. So then please give us your name and address. And I'm Bruce Botten, and I live at 6940 Langford Drive, Edina. All right. And this is Mr. And I'm Alan Costantini. I live at 6942 Langford Drive. Okay. You'll each have three minutes to address the council. I know it's a matter of common concern to both of you, but... Uh, well, obviously, um, we, we've been in communications. We talked to each other on the phone, and we've now provided you with a petition from the owners that are affected by the uh, Loden Apartments, and uh, pretty much spells out how we feel about it, and uh, what we find offensive, and what needs to be managed, and we're reaching out to the city to help us mediate the issue because we don't have the power to do it ourselves. And so that's why Alan and, I are, Alan and I are here tonight to say to you that we've been overpowered by a monster. And the monster being this five-story apartment building that's directly behind us that you allowed to be built by variance. And it's affecting our lives. It's affecting our resale values, our taxes. It's our, affecting our psyches. And it was supposed to be our homes till retirement. And until we couldn't live there anymore, had to go to the home. But at this point, we don't know what's going to happen. So at that point, that's all I got to say. I have a petition. It's signed by a number of, of, of residents of our community. We're all taxpayers of the city of Edina. There isn't one taxpayer over at the Loudoun community at this point. And you haven't collected one nickel of taxes from that property at this point. You've collected money for probably for the affordable housing. Mm -hmm. and probably for the parks, but today there's no tax money being paid. We're, we're, we're very unhappy with the situation based on the fact that we feel like we've just been had. And it's, it's, it's not a very good feeling. And this dog park thing that's a, a real thorn in our backs has to be changed. And we expect the city to step up and talk to these people. And they have 27 acres of land over there. There's plenty of room to put the dog park elsewhere. We don't need to sit on our balconies and watch a bunch of dogs doing their thing. And that's the view we will have. All right, so uh, I know that you and I have visited Mr. Botten and- um, And I've talked my to Mr. Burn is, Mrs. Burnley also. Yeah, my intention is to get over there and meet with you, look at uh, the situation where they want to put the dog park, look at other possibilities, and then I'm gonna meet with Opus. Uh, to see what we can do about that issue. Okay, that's good. Yeah. We appreciate that. But we, the, the, the dog park is absolutely the thorn on our back. And, and there's other issues. You know, they promised that there would be subdued lighting. They put the lighting in just in the last few days. And I look out my window and it's just a glare right into my eyeball. And it's not, and, and 
as, as you know, I'm a school bus driver for the city uh, school system. And if you go up to the high school and look at the lighting that was added at the high school out in the parking lots and compare it to what Opus has put in over there, there's a night and day difference as far as how offensive it is. All right, let me add that issue too. And um, your time there's is There's other up. issues yeah. too. All right, all right. And, Mr. Constantini and thank, uh, thank you for this. And Mr. Constantini, go ahead. I don't have to we'll uh, say too much clock. more that uh, Bruce hadn't said except to say how disappointed I am as a resident of Edina in the attitude through the years of the council. No offense to you, with the exception of Mr. Stewart who voted no on that proposal. And the only way to handle Opus is to stand up to them. And that's your job. That dog park is right under our windows. Why would they put it there? I don't think it's accidental. How dare we say that they can't do whatever they want because they're Opus? Well, it's up to you to say, we are the city of Edina. We are the taxpayers and the residents. We are the people who are there and have been there and are going to be there. And at the very least, they should take into consideration what the concerns are. And they don't. They don't. We put up with the dust and the noise for two years while they've been building that thing. We understand it's a construction project. We're not asking you to tear the building down. We're just saying, look, it's there. We're stuck with it. You know, we didn't want it in the first place, but it's there now. Accommodate the residents as much as you can. And they seem to be doing exactly the opposite. They seem to be doing everything they can to make us miserable. They view us as as, as pooks that that are a thorn in their in, in their side. Exactly. Because we, we the things we want and the things we ask for, the building's not going to go away. But the things we want give us peace and, and, and serenity, and in knowing that the lighting is subdued, and the dog park isn't great in our faces, and that the road has a speed limit. And I've asked them all these questions in multiple emails, and they never have come back to me with one solution. Well, and I asked about the, you know, what about the dog park, and what are you going to do about the aroma of the dog park, as well as just the noise, potentially, of the dogs. And, and uh, Opus uh, project manager's response to me by email was, it's our intention that it not be a problem. It's our intention? Where's your guarantee? What are you going to do to make sure it's not a problem? And there's no concern there. All right. It's their intention. So, so what I have on my list so far, gentlemen, is the dog park uh, issue, the lighting issue, the speed limit on the road that uh, is they've, they, they've just put up a sign home. for 10 miles per hour that, that it is, looks like it's temporary, and but it, they also have balloons in the back of the building and they're showing apartments now, and and I think that's pro probably as, as, uh, as caution for people coming down in there mm -hmm. and through a construction zone. But we, have not, we haven't had any real conversation with them about any of this stuff. And there's one more area that's really of concern to us, is that building's built like a horseshoe. And right in the center of that building is this big amenity area with this big swimming pool. And let's say it's a Sunday afternoon and I have a showing at my, at my, my place, I got it on the market, and all of a sudden there's 200 people with all that ambient noise coming from that pool area that's directed right out of that horseshoe right at us. Well, I know some of the residents who live like next to us are really concerned about that because they're right in the line of fire of that of that amenity area. So I'm I'm sure Edina has noise ordinances, and you know hopefully they'll be. We in, do. In, but is there a curfew involved in these guys? I mean, they're going to go 24 hours. You know, these are these yeah, are I don't think these are can. affluent transients that are going to live there. Is what it comes down to. All right. All right, gentlemen, I've got your, we've got your correspondence. You, I've got my list. Mr. Botten, I'm going to contact you. I'm, I'm you, sorry, you, gentlemen, the time is up. No, I just want to ask Thank you to look at the website. And, and the website refers to sure. it as a resort, a park, okay. a community, a All tropical right. resort. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll try to get in touch with you yet this week, Mr. Botten. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and City Council. My name is Tim O'Neill, and I live at 3537 West Fuller Street in the Creek Knoll neighborhood. My wife and I are there with our four small kids. Some of you might ask where Creek Knoll is. It's a very small neighborhood, one of the smallest in Edina. It's in the very northeast corner of Edina, just south of 54th Street. I am here this evening to present a friendly petition signed by many of our neighbors. We're asking the city for new streets, curb, and gutter, as we are one of the few remaining Edina neighborhoods that does not have modern sewer drainage. I've spoken with the city's engineering department, 
and this work is currently scheduled for 2022. They also told me this, that this was, quote, a pretty small project. A few years ago, this work was scheduled for completion in 2019, but then it was pushed back. I'm sure for good reason, but it was pushed back. Only about 80 property owners will be impacted by this work. We have signatures from many neighbors, including the largest landowner in our neighborhood, St. Peter's Church, which is near the corner of 54th and France. St. Peter's Church is planning a large capital campaign for 2019, which includes new parking lots. They would prefer to have the new street, curb and gutter, done sooner than 2022, so that, it, so that it would coincide with the timing of their project, and in doing so, it would more effectively help correct the water flow issues that they and our neighborhood are experiencing. All the streets in our neighborhoods, in our neighborhood, slopes downward towards the creek, and there is major erosion issues happening at the edge of our yards every time that it rains. The city has been to our house alone twice to fill 12 inch gullies carved by the rain between our grass and the street. It's really wearing away and I know that um, the work that was scheduled in 2019 was pushed back because of the pavement index, but the pavement in Creek Knoll is terrible and I think because it's a small neighborhood it might have gotten overlooked. We're asking the city to please move this project up to 2020 or even better, if it is moved up to 2019, it would coordinate with a similar project being done in the neighboring Chowan Park neighborhood, which would save the city consider considerable money and time. In closing, our neighbor, Danny Roloff, also lives in Creek Knoll. He's a construction management coordinator for the city of Minneapolis. Danny would like to say a few words about why it makes sense to move this project timeline up sooner. So thank you for your time and considering our request. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Mr. Roloff, welcome. Good evening, Council. Like Tim said, my name is Danny Roloff. I'm a resident at 3525 West Fuller Street here in Edina. Uh, for my profession, I work for the City of Minneapolis within the Public Works Operations Department of Surface Water and Sewer. I manage large projects and I specialize in stormwater drainage and sanitary infrastructure. So with that, there's a few issues on my mind when it comes to my property when I look out my window. One being specifically the safety um, of our residents on the streets because of the water flow, the washouts. Our, our street literally runs like a river when it, when it rains. All of that goes straight directly down to our Minnehaha Creek. With the Minnehaha Creek taking all that sediment um, yard waste debris. We have a lot of construction projects in, within our neighborhood and we get a heavy amount of sediment and asphalt flowing down that street. Um, typically in a summer, last summer I cleaned out my street several times and I had to coordinate getting rid of sand and asphalt from my yard, which is kind of hard to do when you live within the city sometimes. Additionally, the property damage that it's causing um, of our own properties and our own yards is significant and, co and takes constant maintenance and upkeep you know, to ensure our yards aren't a big washout. Um, with that, um, the, the church up the street has a very deteriorating parking lot and our roadway is in poor condition, so I get massive chunks of asphalt that end up scattered throughout our street. With that, having a lot of children, having a lot of residents that walk um, on those streets, we have obstacles within our streets. Lastly, the environmental impact that this is causing on the Minnehaha Creek is significant with the erosion factor and the chemicals that are being put in the street are into the creek from the streets and the people's yards. So I'd like you to consider that. Um, thank you for your time tonight, and I hope you can give strong consideration to our request. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Mr. Roloff. Um, do, you, do you have a petition that you've turned in, Mr. O'Neill? Okay. Because what we'll do is refer it to Engineering uh, Director Milner and then have it come back to us for a recommendation to understand what your concerns. I think you should know that this is, uh, at least in my opinion, historic. <laughs> I think you're the first neighborhood that's come asking for a special assessment. And, 
and uh, understand the reasons why. You've got a, a beautiful, charming neighborhood over there, and uh, it, it, all these things that you're talking about, curb, gutter, uh, new street surface, sidewalks, uh, it's just going to make it an even better place. And, and for all of the environmental reasons that uh, Mr. Roloff talked about, I think it's an important project to be thinking about. So let us try to work on this and figure it out and, and uh, see if we can make this work with other projects that make, that make sense from a parallel standpoint. So, Just a, a quick follow-on. Um, in door knocking in that neighborhood, one of the recurring themes was please don't put curb and gutter here. We love our streets the way they are. So, and I said, sorry guys, it's only a matter of time. The next time your streets are done, you're gonna get curb and gutter and this is why you're gonna get it. And so thank you for being um, forward thinking and uh, uh, because we don't do it just to do it, we do it for a whole raft of very good reasons. So thank you. Thank you, and just one follow-on comment. Um, there are only 80 homes impacted, and of those, about 30 currently have kind of an old school curb and gutter. So really it's only 50, and of those, five or six were recently torn down with nobody living there. We have about half signatures represented. The other half are not against. We, I just simply didn't knock on everyone's door. But there are obviously some against, but we're here to petition. Sure. All so right. thank you. Thanks, Mr. O'Neill. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, and I think to that point that Member Brindle is making, uh, when we first started doing street reconstruction projects, one of the th places we did one of the first projects was uh, Kellogg Avenue in the South Harriet Park neighborhood. And they wanted to keep their old rural look with no uh, curb and gutter. And uh, I hear people now from the neighborhood saying we made a big mistake, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, oh, for many reasons, uh, you know, uh, stormwater control, uh, their yards get all chewed up by cars coming up over the top of that surmountable curb, and it just doesn't work very well. So um, let us go to work on that idea. Thanks for coming this evening. And uh, anyone else wish to address the council on a m matter of concern to them? All right, we'll move on from community comment to um, the consent agenda. We've got about seven items on the consent agenda. Is there anyone on the council that wishes to remove an item from the consent agenda? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the consent agenda as shown. So moved. Second. We got a motion and a second to adopt the consent agenda as shown on the uh, main agenda. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, and now, uh, moving on to something that's, uh, we've got the special recognitions and presentations section of the agenda, but this is particularly special tonight as, as we lead off with the uh, Adina Crime Prevention Fund uh, awarding of uh, the Mike Satari Officer Officer of the Year Award, and <clears throat> our, our Chief Dave Nelson is here to make the presentation uh, to uh, somebody that we have come to greatly admire on our police staff, as we do all of our other officers, but uh, uh, Brian Hubbard, and uh, what a great uh, night for recognition for Officer Hubbard. Yes. Chief. Good evening, Mayor and Council <clears throat> members, city staff, friends, and family. Thank you for having us here tonight to present the seventh annual Mike Satari Officer of the Year Award, which is sponsored by the Dyna Crime Fund. A Little bit about the Crime Fund. They've been a valued community partner for over 45 years now, and the fund was originally developed to raise money through contributions so the police department could have reward money to offer in investigating and trying to solve some more serious crimes. Over the years, the Crime Prevention Fund has grown and they currently provide support for many unbudgeted equipment and outreach programs, including our canine program, motorcycle unit, bike patrol and foot patrol, Night to Unite, Junior Police, Citizens Academy, Neighborhood Engagement Officers, and I sincerely thank the board for all of their support. Little history on the award. Mike Satari, served as the department's 10th full-time chief from 1999 through 2009. During his tenure, he concentrated his efforts to have the department become more proactive when addressing crime trends and developing positive relationships with the community. In his honor, the Crime Fund created the annual award. Each year, the Crime Fund solicits nominations from our community in search of recognizing one officer who has met at least one of the following criteria. 
performed above and beyond the department expectations, has focused on making Edina a safer place to live, or has focused on the advancement of the department as a whole. The Crime Fund Board reviews all of the nominations and selects the officer they believe um, best fits the criteria and is deserving of this prestigious award. As a board member, I enjoy going through all the nominations because each one speaks volumes about the excellent work served by our dedicated officers. This year's recipient has demonstrated years of performing above and beyond the department ex ex excuse me, expectations and the advancement of the department as a whole. After Brian was selected as uh, the uh, officer of the year, I called Mike Satari and, and gave him a heads up on who was uh, nominated because Brian was, was hired when Mike Satari was still here. Mike's comment to that was, Brian was an excellent hire. He will do excellent things for our department. And I couldn't agree with him more. So I'd like to invite Brian to step up beside me. Sergeant Hubbard came to us in 2007 after making a career change from a management position at the YMCA where part of his responsibilities were to develop and manage community programs. Brian brought that skill set with him here and he is consistently looking for new ways to build relationships with the community and paint a positive picture of the Edina Police Department. He has done this through his participation with Beyond the Badge, Citizens Academy, which he developed and implemented in 2009. He worked as a school resource officer, a DARE officer, where in both of those positions, he focused on building relationships with our youth. He's been very active with Special Olympics, um, both with the Polar Plunge and the Law Enforcement Torch Run. Coordinates our Neighborhood Engagement Officer Program, where officers have the opportunity to meet with neighborhood groups <clears throat> in a more casual setting and strengthen relationships with the community. Brian also coordinates Night to Unite, and he was involved in the city initiative of the Government Alliance with Race and Equity. Brian has also been an active member of the Race and Equity Task Force, which is made up of city staff and residents from within our community with the goal to improve the quality of the life of our community members. Brian also serves on the Law Enforcement Memorial Association as a board member. Uh, the efforts of, the, of Lima are to focus on support of surviving family members of peace officers who have sacrificed their lives in the line of duty. Brian also coordinated a trip for several of our officers to have the opportunity to participate in National Police Week in Washington, D.C. last year. And most recently, Brian was selected to be the vice president of the board. With everything Brian does, beyond the call of duty, Brian still manages to maintain a healthy, strong family life and is here with his wife and children who are here tonight um, to show their support. Thank you. And I spoke earlier about the criteria of the Mike Satari Officer of the Year Award as being performing above and beyond department expectations and having a focus on the advancement of the department as a whole. I stand beside Brian tonight to present him with this award I'm honored to present this to him. Congratulations, Brian. Thank you. If I may, Mr. Mayor. Please. Mr. Mayor and members of the council, I would like to share with you briefly why I'm a blessed man tonight. I'm blessed because I have an amazing wife of 24 years this month. Thank you, Heather, for enduring a consuming nonprofit career and a significant career change into another consuming career. Thank you for your patience, for spending so many nights sleeping alone, for enduring the missed meals and outings, for always making our family first, and for being the real rock behind my success. I love you. I'm blessed because I have three outstanding, amazing kids. Marcus, Katie, and Reagan. Thank you for allowing me to sleep during the day most of the time, for laughing and joining in my silliness, for being loving, supporting, and encouraging of me, and for the different ways you make us proud of you. I love you all. 
I'm blessed with a mother and a mother-in-law that are always encouraging, always proud, and always caring about our family more than we deserve. I'm blessed by some outstanding friends that care about us unconditionally, live life with us, share life's ups and downs, laugh with us, and support us no matter what. I'm blessed that I work with a chief, a police administration, and a city administration that supports what we do every day, trusts our decision, and does what they can to help us be successful. As I continually have opportunities to talk with colleagues around the state, I know this is often not the case, and this is not something I ever take for granted. I'm blessed to work with an outstanding group of dispatchers and support staff. These groups are unquestionably the unsung heroes that work tirelessly behind the scenes to make our success happen, and we would absolutely be lost without their work, dedication, and professionalism. I'm blessed to have the opportunity to work with our friends and colleagues at Edina Fire. This first-rate group of professionals are absolutely the best in the business, and I appreciate their work and camaraderie. I'm blessed to have been hired to work in a community that is so highly supportive of our police officers. The encouragement, cards, emails, food, waves, and random thank yous by our community is not unnoticed nor unappreciated. It is an honor to serve this community, to have so many opportunities to connect and partner with this community, and to have the trust, respect, and admiration of the people we work for. Lastly, but definitely not least, I'm blessed to work alongside an absolutely amazing group of men and women that proudly wear the Edina Police Department uniform. This award is incredibly humbling and such a high honor because I work with a group of individuals who come to work every day with the goal of doing well and making a difference, all of whom are deserving of this award. When I had my chief's interview with former Chief Satari, he told me that he didn't care what our focus was when we were working, whether it was traffic stops or arrests, driving neighborhoods, community outreach, etc. He simply asked that at the end of the day we are able to tangibly articulate how we made this community a better place. I am so proud to work with an entire department of people who daily go out of their way to make this happen one way or the other. This award really belongs to each one of them for what they do on a daily basis that no one sees. I probably don't need to tell anyone in this room that the last five years have been difficult ones for those in law enforcement and their loved ones. The profession has brought some of this on itself and like anything we should and I believe do continue to push forward towards striving for better. However, if you were able to see like I do the hard work, dedication and passion to serve as well as the unwavering care, compassion and empathy shown to people often in their absolute worst times, you would certainly agree that we do it right fairly and with great honor and dignity so, so often. And they do it day in and day out, 24 hours a day, no matter what, and often at great personal sacrifice. Thank you to my colleagues for all that you do and for the things that often go unnoticed. I stand tall and proud to call you partners. Continue to be safe. My God has blessed me richly and I'm appreciative of the opportunity to share these blessings with you tonight. Thank you very much for this high honor.
comment that uh, we share <coughs> Brian's thoughts. We're feeling blessed that all of you serve us and serve all the people of the city that, whether you're firefighters or police officers. And tonight we get the chance to share a special blessing uh, to have you on the force and uh, thank the Crime Fund for a, a, a fabulous selection uh, for the Mike Sakari Award. So thank you, Chief. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thanks all of you as well. There, I have one more piece for you. You can go ahead and sit down. <laughs> <laughs> so in talking about the Officer of the Year, we were focused on 2017. I wanted to bring up just a short blip on what uh, Brian's initiative for 2018 is racing for the community. And I have a one-minute video I'd just like you to watch instead of me telling you what he's doing. Thanks. Beyond the Badge is brought to you by the Edina Crime Prevention Fund and... Triple A Minneapolis. On New Year's Day, I donned my full uniform and ran the Polar Dash 5K in St. Paul. Get set! Happy New Year! It was 10 below, but I wanted to give more people a chance to see police officers in a positive light. I'll be running 17 more races throughout the year. The next one is the Valentine's Day Twin Cities 5K in Minneapolis. I'll be raising money and awareness for the Minnesota Law Enforcement Memorial Association, which helps fallen officers' families, as well as Cornerstone, a group dedicated to serving victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. I appreciate the tremendous amount of support and encouragement from residents and fellow officers. If you're interested in coming out to cheer me on or participating, please contact me via email. Oh, terrific. There we go. That's a look at Thank 2018. You. All thank right. You. I also want to thank uh, uh, some of the members of the Crime Prevention uh, Board being here this evening. Former Mayor Metzold and his wife Linda in the back. And I see John Barnett and his wife Mary Jo. And then, of course, we've got two council members. Who oh, was Heather? I couldn't Heather's see. Here. There. Heather Edelson, thank you for being here as well. And uh, our colleagues, Kevin Staunton and Mary Brindle, also on the Crime Prevention Board. So. Uh, thanks to all of you for a wonderful, wonderful selection in Officer Hubbard. All right. Thank you. And our next uh, agenda matter is we've got uh, an update on this. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Gunyu, welcome. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. What a tough act to follow. What a tough act to follow. Great speech, though. Holy cow. What a special occasion. Um, nice to be here to see a few familiar faces from different walks of life that uh, uh, you're here. I, as many of you know, I, I represent the Dinah community on the Three Rivers Park Board. And for the past six years, I have been honored to be the board chair of the board. And uh, I wanted to just give you an a update on kind of what we've been doing that might be of interest to the community, as well as a little bit of an overview of the variety of things we do, because most people don't really have an appreciation of the diversity of things we're involved in. Uh, much of it has to do with the difference of our mission. We're very not typical of a, a city or a county uh, parks and rec department. We, we are only about a probably only about a dozen of us in the country that are unique uh, board like we serve. Uh, very heavily oriented toward environmental stewardship as well as education programs and uh, training type things that we, that we do with, uh, with a focus on the natural re resource based system. Uh, we're big. Uh, that's the way I usually make the distinction. We, uh, we have uh, 27,000 acres we manage and about 40 percent of all the regional trails in the entire metro area. Of the 11 million visitors we serve every year, uh, about 40 percent of those are trail visitors. It's the fastest growing aspect of what we do. Uh, and uh, what we're actually investing quite a bit of, quite a bit of our money into now, nowadays. Uh, on the environmental stewardship area, excuse me, 
<clears throat> excuse me. Um, we're very committed to the whole quality of life that really has made Minnesota what it is. I, I, I don't know, I, I'm sh I know some of you personally that you share some of the concerns of some of the trends at the national level and even at the state level about uh, environmental and uh, natural resources issues. And so that's one thing our board unanimously feels very strongly about with that mission uh, that we continue that. One of the things we've had for years is a policy in which uh, only no more than 20% of any of our parks or reserves can ever be used actively. So there's a, there's a, a guarantee that 80% will always be preserved in its natural site, uh, state, uh, or in, and then uh, in many cases restored to its, its natural, its natural um, well, original, original uh, situation. If you, uh, I'm not going to go through everything in the interest of time, but uh, we're involved in so many different things, everything from scientific research of frogs and, uh, and lake plantings to, uh, we've planted two million trees over probably the past four decades. We have our own tree farm, uh, which makes it a little easier. But uh, it's interesting to me, I was talking to the manager there the other day, and he said, they're now planting seedlings uh, for 20 years from now, so that when they are actually planted and then become part of our parks and reserves, it'll reflect the changes in the climate uh, with the different zones that we're, that we're experiencing now, so that we're thinking ahead, not just planting what Minnesota has always seen uh, the current time. Bryant Lake is now uh, unimpaired, which is one of the few lakes that, that's been reversed as a result of our our work. Uh, heavy education work for uh, school children primarily, but beyond that, uh, our nature centers, uh, STEM programs. We, we have a working farm that most people are not aware of, Gale Woods Farm. We, uh, the, the time I see most of that is when we, uh, we started going to our, for our day at the Capitol, which was last week, and uh, none of our other exhibits hold a, hold a candle to the fact when we bring our our lambs and chickens and uh, snakes, and you have you know you have the speaker of the house with his dark suit on picking up a lamb for a photo op and those sorts of things. But I think it, it helps uh, communicate the fact that we do a lot of education that's different than just the the typical sort of parks things. Uh, we're of course most known for our parks and reserves. One of the couple of highlights is uh, you're probably aware that we replaced the the chalet at Highland Hills, and if, I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to be out there or experienced the previous chalet, but uh, my children went through the old chalet, and I, I wish the new one had been there at the, at the time. I, I no longer, you no longer trip over boot bags every, every, every two feet when you're trying to get through the common area. It's become very popular. We're renting it pretty extensively now, especially during the summer for uh, weddings and events. In fact, we have a, a an old car show that's, uh, that's going to be there in, uh, within the next month. A lesser known is probably on the back side of the mountain, on the Richardson side, we put pretty major investments in our uh, cross-country ski trails. One of uh, only 10 facilities in the country that can offer the lighted and, uh, I'm not allowed to say artificial snow, it's uh, dependable snow is what we say, um, that there are loops, that, there are fabulous facilities if you're cross-country skiers to use. We actually have ski jumping. Good example of, we don't actually, uh, we provide facilities and uh, training for lifelong skills, but we don't run teams, we don't sponsor those sort of things. So in this case, there's a, there are nonprofits that actually run those things that use our, our facilities. We also, uh, perhaps Sergeant Hubbard would like to, to participate in one of our races. We have signature races that uh, one of them, one of the recent ones was a combination uh, cross country and fat tire bike race, which uh, are a lot of fun uh, to not participate in for me, but at least to watch. One of the things uh, that we're working on now, which will be the next major regional park in the metro area, is uh, the Mississippi Gateway Park. We own uh, Coon Rapids Dam. Uh, we own a lot of things that were given to us for whatever reason over the years, and when the, the Corps of Engineers uh, finally fixed the gates, we decided to do something more with that, so we approached Brooklyn Park and formed a partnership, because they own a lot of the land in that area, and we're going to do a joint development in that area. It'll be uh, probably the, the first new major park of this type, and when our, our staff came in, 
uh, with, with great plans, as they always do, the board's reaction was, this is great, but you know, it, it looks a little like what we do everywhere else with the Nature Center and all that. And this is the Mississippi River. This is the signature river of the country, if not in a lot of parts of the world. So could this be something different than that? And they came back uh, with some phenomenal concepts that are basically making it a, a gateway as an environmental education center, uh, focused on the river, of course, but it also then is going to become our hub for our outreach efforts into all the other communities. We're already doing that in the, in the small buildings that are there now, but it'll be a, a major project down the road. We do a lot of park partnerships that uh, one of the things that our board decided to do when we had our first, there was a pretty major turnover six years ago when I actually joined the board and, and we, uh, our first retreat, uh, we talked about priorities and there was a, a good, good discussion about, uh, the staff came in with all the statistics about how 99% of everybody that uses our parks love them. And our reaction was, that's all fine and good, but what about all the people who don't uh, use our parks or trails or, you know, what are their ratings or why aren't they using it? So it really was a sea change in uh, approach as to how we look at things. And uh, conceptually, what it meant is that we're doing much more uh, to uh, provide access and programs for uh, first-tier suburbs, basically, because most of our facilities are located in the exurban areas. So it's the ring from, actually the ring, the ring that I represent, so it's the ring from Richfield through Edina and Hopkins and, uh, and then up to uh, 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 Crystal New Hope all the way up to Brooklyn Park, Robbinsdale and that. So we're forming partnerships and our objective is to have a partnership with every community in doing things like, uh, so Hockey Park, if you're familiar with, it's just north of Theodore Worth and it's owned by Robbinsdale and Golden Valley and we said, gosh, here's a, we're not, we're not gonna obviously buy 100 acres of land in the, you know, in the communities, but it allows us then to form a partnership in which they, can, they continue to own it, but we're developing uh, both facilities and uh, programs in that area. We're already offering programs in that area. Then, depending on if anything happens, actually, actually happens with um, uh, the Botno line, then uh, they'll pay for a significant part of that also. Taft, a little closer to home, Taft Park in Richfield. We've uh, made kayaking and fishing uh, pier improvements in that area. We have a paddle station where you can rent kayaks. It's uh, their lockers that you can reserve online and go and uh, you get the code and use the kayak and put it back in and pay for it in the same way. We, uh, this summer, it's gonna be our inaugural, uh, we, have a, we bought a portable zip line and, uh, and a portable planetarium. I think we're inspired by the uh, Super Bowl. For the, it's not near what that is, but it's uh, something we can take to local parks and uh, get kids interested in being outdoors. The planetarium is, is like one of those big uh, jumping things that you, except you don't jump in it, you actually see stars and things like that. Uh, just one other uh, that I'll mention is the, is the Airports Commission owns the Crystal Airport and there's a, a large open area, pretty natural area next to that and so we've uh, formed a partnership with the MAC and, and Crystal to redevelop that area. So the uh, first step was to replace the boardwalks that were mostly submerged in that area. And now we're offering uh, programming, uh, environmental education in that area for kids to sign up. Um, regional trails, I, you know, I, needs no introduction. Obviously, you're all very aware of our, our, what I call our signature trail. I think now that we're, we are 99% complete. I think with the April snowstorm, we still, I think at Walnut Ridge, we still have one section that we need another month to, to get done. You can, okay. Two ramps leading to the board. You can, uh, you can get through that area, but it's not as, <laughs> it's not, but it's, uh, I mean, this was a long time coming. In fact, the first call I got after my election six years ago was from the mayor saying, when is this going to get built? And so I, I think I can finally say we're a month away from the grand opening now. I, I can't remember if it's the second or the third. It's June either, 3rd, Sunday, June 3rd, June 3rd 10 Sunday. in the morning okay. at Fred Richards Park. Okay, yep. <laughs> and uh, I mean, this is, uh, obviously it's been heavily used before it was complete. I mean, I kept getting uh, word from people about uh, the, you know, the spectacular boardwalks we have that are, it really is uh, a, unique, a unique trail. 
And I think it's, uh, we'll have hundreds of thousands of users right off the bat. It's, uh, it's, I think it's going to be very close to the, to the usage and the type of usage we have on our, our cedar, uh, cedar trails that tie in, which uh, just as, a, as an aside, I, as I mentioned, we have four or five million uh, trail users in our, in our whole system, but uh, increasingly they are commuters. We have probably about, on some of these trails like this, and I think the, the, uh, the others are about 25% commuters for not, not just recreational, which they traditionally were. So it, a commuter for not just work, but uh, for shopping, school, those sorts of things, which um, is a, a different development. And obviously then there'll be other things that tie into this trail as we continue planning. Uh, just a couple examples. The, uh, Skip to the bottom there. The, we've started a rail corridor study uh, to connect Nine Mile with the Minnesota River. So we're starting to look at railroads are always so easy to deal with. You know, it's, uh, it's, so we're, we're hopeful, though, that over time we'll be able to use, it's a pretty wide corridor, not at all like the uh, Southwest LRT <laughs> bottleneck. But I think we'll have, uh, we have some pretty good hopes that we can, we can do more north-south connections because that's the challenge now. We have a lot of east-west mm -hmm. connections. A uh, couple of others with Southwest LRT, we have a partnership with the county. Uh, we'll have to do three major trail separated crossings. And actually, uh, even if, if and when that happens, uh, these will proceed because they're, they're necessary. And we have a separate funding agreements that but we're trying to uh, coordinate you know, when, that, when that project goes forward. Uh, and aside this on-ramp connections, we, we had a, an idea about how to um, improve the local connections to our trails. We kind of refer to our trails as the interstate system and that we didn't have very good connections. I think in the past we kind of viewed it as you, you know, drive through communities on these, but uh, the connections weren't as uh, thought out. And so in order to stimulate some of that thinking, we solicited interest and went to the Met Council to get uh, federal funding in this case. And uh, there are five communities were, were chosen. We got a million dollars then to, to fund these uh, connections in those, those five cities. And then the Met Council informed us that that would be the last they'd ever do that because it was, it was too popular. It made too much sense, I think, in my, in my standpoint. But it was, I think we could have sold a lot more of that type of uh, trail usage if we had would stayed with it. We wish um, you uh, good luck with the CP rail. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we tried to, you know, work with them on the, on the north-south segment through Edina. And uh, if you need help there, we'd be glad to enlist the assistance of some of our council members who have a, Absolutely. have a keen interest in it. In fact, I think our thoughts were we'd, uh, we'd Pick the easier low-hanging fruit to start with, and then eventually, you know, we'd, we're, we're pretty long-term opportunistic. But I hope you're not being facetious because I think uh, no, we're not. Oh, okay, we, good. We want that north-south connection. We want to. Yeah, absolutely, you know, very important. I think run because all the way to the Minnesota River and oh yeah, come, come north with it. That's the objective. All the way up into St. Louis Park. So. Yep. In fact, we have some legislators uh, talking about it now too. So we're we're hopeful that we can get something done with. Like you said, the yeah, mayor, the key is the railroad. A um, couple of the, uh, uh, two major projects that we've we've also kicked off. The this is just the corridor planning, so it's it's not alignments right away, that kind of stuff. Uh, in the West Metro, one would connect French Park in Plymouth, and then uh, with with the Bryant Lake Park, uh, going through the Minnetonka Community Center area. And then also connecting that same area, and, and that's where the uh, Southwest LRT uh, trail runs through, with the uh, Wyzetta and Dakota Rail. The, uh, right now, the trailhead is at the west end of downtown, and with their lake effect, uh, we'll have a cycle track through uh, down Lake Street, actually, that will connect that then eventually down to tie in with this, with this network. So. Um, I wanted to give you kind of a feeling about how we're doing that. Right now we're at the stage where we're listening and opening and, and we have pop-up events which are, uh, what they are is we, we bring our van out and then, uh, well, we've done it with uh, 50th Street um, uh, open streets in Edina. We've done it, uh, we do it at uh, farmer's markets, that sort of thing where we, we share some of these ideas with the local people that are there and they give us 
really good feedback. And the last thing I want to talk about was our community engagement. And this is something that we've made a major effort. We've reallocated funds. We've, we've put new funding, hundreds of thousands of dollars, a greater effort to try to engage uh, populations and geographic areas that haven't traditionally used Three Rivers Parks. And it's, as I mentioned earlier, the focus is really on the first tier uh, communities. And, uh, and the focus is also on children and seniors. The, the idea is we, rather than have them uh, with less access to try to get to our existing facilities, is we bring those into, into the communities um, with, and in many cases, partnerships with, uh, with the local recreation department. So we, it's different in every community because we, it, whatever makes sense for them and what their interests are that not replicate but to supplement whatever whatever their interests are. Uh, just a couple examples of that. We, had, we call it our Parks on the Go van, uh, which I, I call it a bookmobile with an owl. But at, and most people don't know what I'm talking about when I say bookmobile. But it's a, uh, it's a way to bring everything from slack lines to animals into different areas. You've probably seen it around Edina. These are just a few of the things I picked out that where we've been to the Nature Nuts Day Camp to the uh, uh, Opportunity Fair at the high school and things like that where we're, we're trying to get people more interested in, in outdoor activities. One of the things we've, we've done that has been very successful, we started, this will be our third year, is Explorer Camps. And so what we've done in this case is we, we a conduct a week-long camp in the community. Uh, part of that is to bring the participants out into our nature centers and things like that, but most of it is all done in the community at whatever park makes sense in Edina. Uh, we, we've done that in Pamela Park and we're going to continue that again this summer. Also, it's been very popular and fully subscribed. Uh, right now we're looking at ways to try to increase the capacity so that we can we can even let more more kids get involved. As you know, it's uh, there's a greater disconnect with uh, kids and the outdoors for any number of reasons. And so what we're trying to do is to re make that reconnection because it's, uh, it's one of those things about early, like early childhood education. The payoff of that is, is great when you, when you get kids more involved in the outdoors. We even do it with seniors. So it's not just the youth but the seniors. And at the Hopkins Activity Center, we've done, we've done similar things for the, the senior programs there. John, with the Parks on the Go uh, vehicle, you might think about our Open Streets um, event that we have. We have been there. Yep. Yeah. In okay. fact, I, uh, we, we'd well, welcome a more Street central Festival location. Right. I missed that one. Yeah. I jumped right by it on the high school. Okay, good. Thank yep. you. Yep. That's, and we'll be there again. We'll be there again this year. I don't think there'll be room for you at the art fair, but uh, that would be no, an interesting idea. It's too. probably, uh, but yeah, I think, and also it's kind of a different, uh, we do have an art, if you're familiar with our Silverwood uh, in, uh, uh, project, it's an old Y camp that we bought uh, recent, not too recently, but probably about 15 years ago in St. Anthony. And it's an art-oriented uh, outdoor nature connection. So we, in fact, we have the St. Anthony schools. Uh, kids have done nature art that's being displayed now there. But like I said, we kind of do a little bit of everything, but, but probably not. I'm sure it would not be juried at the, uh, <laughs> at the, at the art fair. Uh, park partners, this, uh, just to, in closing, I, I just wanted to mention we do, it's not just with communities, but we've started a number of projects with the schools and libraries and nonprofits where we do similar things. Uh, one, one example would be uh, Hopkins School District and the Lowry Nature Center, which is at Carver Park, uh, which actually is not even in Hennepin County. But we, we're looking for ways to connect those outlying parks with the first tier. And so we now have uh, an exchange of expertise. So we have our naturalists there going into, uh, into the school and teaching programs. And actually, uh, we, we have probably about two dozen licensed teachers on our staff. So they're, they develop curriculum. They do those things to help, uh, help supplement what the schools are involved in. And then we have field trips out to our nature centers. And, Things like that. Um, we are also uh, really involved in what I would call unique types of camps. We, we have a, a special camp for uh, kids on the uh, autism spectrum that we work with uh, the nonprofit that kind of as the experts in that area. So they help our, 
our staff understand how to structure camps and do that, uh, as well as so it goes kind of both ways. We can ride, if you've heard, they, it's a similar program that's uh, horses. They take kids that are challenged in many different ways, and it's a therapy where they uh, learn to ride and uh, supervised, obviously, and, and care for horses. They were operating at the, the county home school. I always get the name wrong because I'm too old. I remember the old names we used for that. But it's, uh, and that was then uh, repurposed. I think the county wanted to do something different in that area. So we had a stables out in, uh, by uh, Baker, well, Baker, not, not on Baker National <laughs> Golf, but uh, at Baker. And we said, well, you know, why don't you come out here? So we made some joint improvements. And so they're operating that program out there. Operation No Limits is for um, at-risk youth, uh, ranging everywhere from referrals from the courts to uh, s serving community service. And it's the same kind of philosophy as trying to get kids in a diversion program um, in, in more productive outdoor activities. And it's, it's, it's pretty rewarding to see the, that much like, uh, much like the award here, so you, if you do the right type of outreach, you can make a big difference early on. And just in conclusion, I'd say that um, one of the mayors we're working with, and I, I can't at this point remember, but I remember his comment was, this is the way government's supposed to work. And I, I think that really uh, sums it up. I, our, our strong philosophy at this point is we want to be good partners. Uh, we want to work with all of our communities and do what makes sense uh, to you. And... Um, Working together like that is, I think, what our, our common, our common um, taxpayers expect us to do. So, be glad to answer any questions you might have. Questions for Mr. Gunyu, Me Thank Member you. Stewart. Hey, I don't really have a question. I just want to, um, I think, reinforce what you're saying. I, 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 the scope of what Three Rivers Park District is is really quite grand, and I, I hope people who are tuning in tonight. Uh, uh, become more aware of that and we'll seek out opportunities. You guys have a website that sh shows uh, what's happening and where. And, uh, and I really encourage people to take advantage of this amazing resource we have in our community. I, I think the uh, Three Rivers Park District has been very innovative and done a lot of interesting programs. One uh, that touched my life a few years ago, my children, when they were younger, were part of a rowing program that oh. uh, takes place at Bryant Lake Park in, yeah. uh, in Eden Prairie. And uh, I think Three Rivers Park District had been an excellent partner for the rowing program, which is a youth rowing program. Yeah. And again, getting kids out, getting them on the water, uh, finding ways to do that. And I think it's been um, a great partner there. Uh, as I mentioned before, I live right near Walnut Ridge Park. And, right. uh, and so I'm watching, waiting <laughs> for those last ramps to get built so that yeah. the whole thing's completed. But. We've been hiking the part that is completed and, and just really love it. And I, I hope everybody gets out and uses that trail once it's done. June 3rd, 10 o'clock a.m. at Fred Richards Park is the grand opening. Great. Yep. <laughs> so, thank, thank you. you. Speaking of uh, taking on Member Stewart, somebody asked me this morning at our rotary meeting, what was the cost of the bridge over the crosstown? <gasps> And I didn't oh. uh, have an answer for that. I had a total project cost answer, but I, at least I thought I had an accurate answer. I, I can tell you the total project. I'm sorry, I don't know. Um, uh, wh which bridge was it? I'm sorry. The one Here. over the Crosstown below oh, the cross high school. Oh, Crosstown, yeah. Um, yeah, the total project was about $25 million, um, half of which was federal funds, and half was, um, I would say, our funds. It's uh, our, our own internal uh, tax tax based funds and all that we use for that, but um, the bridges were i, I couldn 't even say I can get you that number, but they were the three bridges were the three uh, grade separated crossings were the the major costs that we mm -hmm. incurred in doing this. Uh, boardwalks are also expensive but very necessary i mean that 's kind of the way you you do trails through that type of of setting so we 're about ready to opened this uh, up for its full length. We've been the city that's been uh, the hole in the entire regional system, which that's is right. a wonderful thing. We thank you for that. I know there's been some ongoing discussion between our staff and, and Three Rivers and maybe other communities as well about how are we going to maintain this on a year-round basis so that people can use it uh, to its, uh, you know, make it realize its full potential here for, from a usage standpoint. Yeah, What's the status I, I, on that? 
Oh, I'm sorry, Mary. Uh, in fact, that, I can assure you that planning is underway. In fact, I, I thank Scott for uh, precipitating that. Uh, we have, uh, if the rest of you are not familiar, is uh, I mentioned earlier that with the commuting use of the trails, they are much more year-round used than they were traditionally. Our, um, our policy, long-standing and, and antiquated policy for, for uh, winter maintenance was developed years ago uh, and it really had more to do with the fact that in those days there were mostly the outlying areas we had trails and so we were balancing um, snowmobile use along with you know the hikers and, and equestrian use and all that so it's something that's needed to be updated for for many years and and I think this is the perfect opportunity to do that because um, uh, this as I mentioned earlier this trail and our our uh, cedar trails and those are urban trails. So they're very different than the way we've been managed this on a, on a community by community basis. Uh, I think what it's gonna take, uh, our board has not talked about that yet, but you, you have my assurance we'll have something in place uh, working with all the cities involved uh, before the next snowfall, unless that's next week. <laughs> so I think we're beyond that, but um, I think it, I can just share my own kind of uh, thoughts about it if, if you think that would be useful. Sure. Um, uh, it, it can't, it, I don't see us doing some kind of one size fits all because every community has a different kind of philosophy. So I, I think it's probably going to be based on some kind of classifications. Now the, the trails like Nine Mile uh, are heavily used, they're going to be year round used like, like many of our other trails in kind of the same mostly the southwestern you know, kind of area that's part of this whole network. Those that are in the outlying areas, that are in you know, less populated areas, it doesn't make sense to have the same level of maintenance uh, that those. So I'm, I'm sure that that'll be part of the discussion. I think it's important to have something that's consistent throughout the, the whole system, because as you know, trails don't respect boundaries. So in fact, we've had instances in the past where Let's see, I think it was Shorewood and uh, Excelsior had a disagreement. No, I think it was Tonka Bay, a disagreement about uh, what, you know, not, on, not only should it be plowed, not, not only who's going to plow it, but even should it be plowed. And so we, you know, we can't have a situation where there's uh, sort of different levels of, so we will need to work through all those uh, issues. At the, I think, I'm sure the staff can do that. Um, the other thing that I just off, as I was thinking about this was, uh, I'm not sure, it, it, well, I think in many cases cities do a much better job. So it's not just, uh, I, I think it's our responsibility to make sure, you know, that the costs and everything gets done. But I think as far as the who does it or how it's done, um, I can see that being uh, more of a sort of what, what makes the most sense. I think uh, communities, I mean, you're out there plowing more regularly than we are. Uh, you know, you have a greater capacity to do those sorts of things. Uh, in some cases, have we, as we've done some pilots on this, we've actually hired third parties to do that. So, all I can tell you at this point is uh, I can assure you that we'll have something in place and it'll be open year round. Oh, yeah. wonderful news. But, Thank you. Yeah. Just, uh, yes. I, I, I just wanted to, um, in the spirit of this last slide of moving forward together, I just wanted to. Um, commend your staff on the work on the trail. Uh, you know, there were at least a couple of instances, as there are, I'm sure, on every single project that ever gets done where <laughs> something goes a little haywire. And your staff was so good at bringing, not surprisingly, a parks-focused approach to trying to solve problems and, and I think did a terrific job of balancing concerns of neighbors and members of the community, but also continuing to have a park focused mission on the on the project and and to the extent we had any hiccups they got resolved in a really satisfactory way so thanks to them and and I, my own experiences it's always uh, terrific professionalism whenever we deal with the three rivers park staff well, mayor council member stan i i really appreciate your comments and i i was remiss in not saying your staff and and the board has been uh fabulous to work with. Um, as you can imagine, with 40 different communities we're working with, there are uh, 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 a wide variety of, uh, of situations that we have to deal with. But your staff has been 
equally professional and it's really easy to work through that. And I, wa I want to thank the council for, at the appropriate times, making those decisions that needed to be made in, in order to keep things moving along. Because this wasn't a, in fact, I remember my first conversation, I knew Mayor Hovland before this walk of life I'm in, and, and uh, he was pretty frank about, this was a tough decision for us to approve this, now you gotta get it done. So, <laughs> so and that was absolutely right, so. Thank you. Member Brindle. Thank you. Well, uh, thinking back to uh, some of the first conversations I had as a council member were around this trail. With me, in fact. Yes, I think. exactly. <laughs> and, um, and talking to members of the community who were very anxious about um, where this trail was going to come through and it was going to be very close to where they are and gee, that, you know, my kid's swing set is right where that's going to be. And, and, uh, and people have owned their property for years and they just, they used all the, all the property right down to the creek. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, just to having the vision of, well, we can't not do this, we just need to do it the right way. And, uh, and then having, having the decision taken away, you know, we'd have the watershed district here and we'd have three rivers here. Well, you know, the chicken and the egg and, and who's going to do what first and gee, the, the watershed's going to do their job differently if there's no trail. So we just need to know if there's a trail. And so just kind of get your head around that discussion as well. But, um, and now after the FEMA flood, floodplain, it changed all of it so that so much of the trail is now elevated. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but in the, in the long run, um, as, as it becomes a reality, uh, just pieces as they were finished, people were on them right away. And so now to think that we can traverse the entire city, get through Richfield and get, you know, and and the opposite direction and get out through Hopkins and and Wyzetta and and points beyond. So it's really exciting to be the you know we saw that disconnected piece and now it's <laughs> yeah. really exciting to know that we're all connected up and and the other improvements that are going to continue to happen. So thank you for your leadership. Uh, it's been uh, it's been a learning experience to watch this happen with great humongous documents of all of all that goes into this. It's uh, it's it's not easy and uh, it's not a small project, but um, nobody does it better than Three Rivers. They just do a marvelous job. Well, thank you so much, Mayor and Councilmember Rindle. I I, I often say that our staffs all make, make us all look pretty good mm -hmm. regularly, and I, I think this is one of those cases where they've done a fabulous job of really working fabulous. through all those inevitable issues that always always come up. But I always you know try to encourage people that you know in the end it's going to be better than it is today, mm -hmm. and we'll take care of it. All of that. But, and it doesn't yeah. hurt that Jonathan Vlaming grew up here. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and he used to work at the Met Council, and I think knows where every pot of money is that uh, uh, <laughs> exists. So very good. he is a he is not only a planning wizard but a financial wizard too. I think. Oh, right great. Covering. Well, thank you so much. Thank it's you great so to much. See you. Thanks and for having. And don't us. forget that you have uh, great friends over at the tab. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely, so, and, absolutely. Uh, I, I thought Member Staunton touched on something that was really important. I, I think about every time I go down Highway 100 and I see the the little wall you put up or the fencing that you put up over around Lake Edina. Uh, <laughs> the great effort that Eric Nelson and Jonathan Flaming made with those neighbors over there that were so upset and yeah. and were able to calm them down and say, no, we're going to do something that's good for your neighborhood and, and provides those same sorts of uh, protections from uh, car, uh, car lights and other things that you came to enjoy with all of the uh, vegetation that was previously there. Uh, I think you did a marvelous job of that. So take those compliments back home too. And it's been a pleasure, as, I, as all my other council members have indicated, pleasure working with Three Rivers. That's a great, that's great to hear, Mayor. I, I really appreciate that and I'll sure pass that on. And I, I, I know I ruined one pair of shoes tromping around in the mud there when we were trying to look at sight lines and things like that <laughs> to make sure that we were taken care of. Yeah, okay, so. good. Well, thanks for coming over thanks this again. evening. It's thanks. good to have that update. You got some wonderful things going on. Yeah.
All right. Uh, <clears throat> next matter in this portion of the agenda is a proclamation for Kids to Parks Day, May 19, 2018. Uh, whereas May 19, 2018 is the eighth Kids to Parks uh, Day organized and launched by the National Park Trust and held annually on the third Saturday of May. And whereas Kids to Parks Day empowers kids and encourages families to get outdoors and visit America's parks, and whereas it is important to introduce a new generation to our nation's parks, and whereas we should encourage children to lead a more active lifestyle to combat the issues of childhood obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and hyperchlorostemia. And uh, whereas Kids to Parks Day is open to all children and adults across the country to encourage a large and diverse group of participants, and whereas Kids to Parks Day will broaden children's appreciation for nature and the outdoors. And now, uh, therefore, I, James B. Hovland, Mayor of the City of Edina, Minnesota, to hereby proclaim May 19, 2018 as Kids to Parks Day and urge residents of Edina to make time on May 19, 2018, to take the children in their, li in their lives to neighborhood, state, or national parks. Is there a motion to adopt the proclamation? So moved. Second. We got a motion and second on the uh, Kids to Parks Day uh, proclamation. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. You know, I, I think I got closer to that word hyperchloreso. Cl chlorosterolemia every year. Hyperchlorosterolemia last year than I did this year. <laughs> I wasn't ready for it. All of a sudden it sneaked up on me there. All right, we've got one other uh, matter uh, on the um, proclamations side of the world, and we'll make sure this gets to Director Catry, yes. the, yeah. the Parks Res uh, Proclamation. Uh, yesterday I had the pleasure, I don't know if this photo is available or not, um, there it is. That's a gentleman in the uh, wheelchair is uh, Palmer Roxwold. And uh, he lives over at Edinburgh. And uh, those are his four sons standing behind him. And uh, yesterday was his 102nd birthday. And so I thought we should, uh, uh, we should do a proclamation uh, designating April 30th, 2018 as Palmer Roxwold Day in the city of Edina. And the, the proclamation reads as follows. Whereas Palmer Roxwold was born on April 30, 1916, near Litchfield, North Dakota. Palmer was the youngest of the children born to Per and Sariana Roxwold. Palmer's father passed away when he was six months old, and his mother passed away when Palmer was only nine years old. Palmer was raised by his older siblings and aunts and uncles, and whereas by the time he was 16 years old, Palmer was working for a room and board, going to school and playing the accordion at barn dances for $2 a night. And whereas Palmer Roxwold graduated high school and thereafter attended Valley City State Teachers College in Valley City, North Dakota, becoming a rural school teacher where he taught for $60 a month. And whereas during his tenure as a school teacher in North Dakota, Palmer met his future wife, Myrna. Palmer went back to college to complete his bachelor's degree and then married Myrna and moved to Minnesota where he taught high school history, social studies, and conducted marching bands. And whereas Palmer Roxwold went back to college again and received his administrative degree from the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks in 1950 and thereafter served as superintendent of schools for school districts in Donvick, Henning, and Madison, Minnesota, and whereas Palmer and Myrna raised four sons, two of whom became physicians and two of whom became secondary and collegiate educators. Uh, the um, gentleman in the, in the red uh, was one of the first uh, emergency room physicians on the cutting edge of that work, is now doing work in Africa. The gentleman in the green shirt is the head of uh, uh, neurology at Hennepin County Medical Center. Uh, the gentleman in the middle with the blue shirt is a college professor at Mankato State teaches math, and the one on the right is a, uh, was a high school teacher in Mankato. And the woman in the front is a, is a friend of the family. Um, so let's continue on here. Um, Palmer uh, he raised four sons, two of whom became physicians and two of whom became secondary and collegiate ed educators. Myrna passed away in 1980. And whereas after retiring in 1976, Palmer wrote a book, book uh, Per immigrant, and, per immigrant and pioneer about his father's experience emigrating from Norway. And whereas Palmer remarried several years after Myrna passed away and Palmer with his second wife, Betty, moved to Brookdale Senior Living in, in 2007 where he has served four years as association president 
Palmer and Betty traveled extensively, including 10 times to Norway. Betty passed away in 2009. And whereas at 102 years of age, Palmer Roxwold is revered by his four sons, eight grandchildren, and seven great-grandchildren, and still enjoys discussing politics, education, the stock market, and of course, Norway. Uh, now, therefore, I, James B. Hovland, Mayor of Edina, do hereby proclaim April 30, 2018, in the city of Edina as Palmer Roxwold Day, to honor Palmer Roxwold's lifetime of great citizenship and the celebration of his 102nd birth, second birthday as a resident of the city of Edina, Minnesota. Is there a motion to adopt the proclamation? So moved. Second? Second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And uh, Clerk Mangan and I will get the uh, official proclamation over to Palmer. Uh, and uh, thank you for listening to Palmer's story. 102 and, and still doing really well. Thank you. Um, His book is on Amazon. It's called Per or Pear, P E R. Pear. Uh, immigrant yeah, a, and Pioneer. And um, what a cool. What a cool deal. That's four and a half great. stars? Oh, yeah, four and a half and five stars on the reviews. Uh, I asked him who, where the brain power came from for his kids. He said from, from Myrna. Mm -hmm. well, so, of course he did. Self-effacing Norwegian, humble Norwegian. Uh, on to the reports and recommendations portion of the agenda, uh, Mr. Neundorf, our economic development manager, uh, has the first matter in front of us this evening, and that is a proposed... Uh, memorandum of understanding between the city of Edina and the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Uh, Director Neundorf, welcome. Yes, good evening, thank you. Uh, glad to be here the, uh, this evening. Um, I just have a quick introduction to this item. Um, uh, I do want to recognize uh, Andrew Latoya that's in the, in the audience with us. Uh, he is our West Metro engineer with MnDOT. Uh, you might have recognized Andrew. He's been here on several occasions updating us on various projects. And we've been me meeting with him and his colleagues for the last six to eight months as we uh, explore this idea of a freeway lid over a portion of Highway 100. So the item tonight uh, is recommended to, uh, to sign a memorandum of understanding that basically um, identifies some of the shared goals of MnDOT and the city uh, and also identifies tasks that each partner uh, is willing to uh, work on. Uh, it does not obligate or commit either party to any specific outcome or any specific time frame. Um, but as we've explored this concept of a freeway bridge over by uh, Grandview and the city hall area, we get two frequent questions. First one is, what's a lid? And then the second question is, well, MnDOT would never, ever let you do anything like that. So we wanted to, to uh, put this on, uh, on the agenda just to recognize that we are having conversations together and see if we can, can continue those. If there's any questions, right. we're questions happy to for answer. Manager Neuendorf. All right, we've had a discussion about this matter both at the uh, Housing Redevelopment Authority meeting last week and also at the work session this evening. I so. have a couple. Member Brindle. Thank you. I have a couple of things marked in here. Um, this is a, a you know of MOUs. They're usually short and sweet and. This is what I do, this is what you do, this is what we do together, and this is our understanding, sign, sign, sign. Mm -hmm. But this is a detailed memorandum of understanding around the development of the Grandview area and, and, um, and kind of lays the groundwork for why this area is important to us. Um, now, looking at the shared goals, um, I'm wondering about a couple of these, if we can look at them. Um, 3.9 and 3.10 are really similar, so I'm wondering if we can just have one of them. Um, increase the economic productivity of the state land and air for greater, pro greater community benefit. And then 3.10, increase the economic product productivity of the city land for greater community benefit. Um, so, the, the real nut of this that involves MnDOT is the reuse or redefinition of, the, of a new way to use the public right-of-way. 
particularly along Highway 100, and it's a great deal of property. And so I'm wondering if, if there's a reason to delineate it as state land or city land, and instead of identify that as public right of way for community benefit. I, I looked at that and I thought, I wonder why we're looking at this two ways, when really the MOU looks at, I think it looks at it for one benefit. Manager Neundorf, any thought on that? Yes. Um, so there's two distinctions here. Okay. Uh, and that's why there's two separate items. But Great. we can certainly combine them. There's no, no, uh, well, no magic it, in the wording. But I, the, one I the, just need clarification. Sure. So. One of the distinctions is that for the MnDOT right-of-way, we're interested in having conversations about the land as well as the air rights. So we have no intention to build anything in the highway, but okay. we have every intention to talk about building something in the air above the highway. I see. So that's one key distinction. Mm -hmm. The other piece is the city land also includes the city hall parking lot. So that's something that it's not in the right of way, mm -hmm. and it's technically a city parcel. Um, so that's why we broke them out separately. Happy to combine them together if you prefer, um, but that's why we, why we wrote them as two separate line items. All right. Manager Neal. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I, I think it's, it's important for council to know, too, that I think MnDOT has already signed this their side of this and and it's gone oh, through that oh, okay. process of being right. drafted so okay. if there are if there are important material issues that you have with this this is important to tell us that but on the other the on the other side if it's if it's a document you can generally live with uh, it's it's kind of already been vetted through their side oh, anyway okay well um, I can certainly live with it um, there's I mean we are so far beyond putting a shovel in the ground anywhere, or it was so far ahead, it's mm -hmm. so far in the future. Right. Uh, but I just looked at those two and I thought, well, why are there two of these? So I appreciate the explanation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak to the matter? Remember sure. Um, Mr. Mayor, as you mentioned, we had some discussion about this at the work session tonight. I do think it's, you know, we've heard from some folks in the community who were very early on in this whole concept. Um, one of the things we talked about in the work session um, earlier tonight was this notion that um, we're really planning for the future. And the analogy that came up, I, I think Member Brindle brought it up, was Centennial Lakes. I mean, it was a gravel pit at one point, and people had the vision to imagine it as something else. And uh, it really has turned into a terrific asset for our community and made the community a better place. And the difference between the late 80s and now is we don't have any more land to develop like that. And so this kind of idea of thinking about whether there are places we could add uh, assets that would make the community a better place, um, I think is worth exploring. Uh, ultimately, it will depend on whether it fits into those strategic objectives we have about improving the the assets and services and amenities for the members of our community, making sure we have a connected and sustainable development in the community and being uh, an engaging and inclusive community. And I think we're trying to measure it against those and it takes a lot of, um, a lot of details to work out at the same time. So I, I applaud staff for moving forward on this. Um, I think the Memorandum of Understanding does a nice job of outlining the respective roles that MnDOT and we will play as we try to talk further about this. And it also does a nice job of telling a story about where we've been and what we're thinking is the possibility here. And so people who are watching and saying, you know, now you've got an agreement with MnDOT and you're off and running, we're still in the first inning. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of discussion to go before we get anywhere. But I think it's really something worth thinking about as we imagine the future of our community, just like those who've come before us have thought big about what could be possible and have made our community a better place. So I'm uh, supportive, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Member Stewart. I too am supportive. I just want to build on uh, the comments that Member Brindle and Member Staunton made. Um, for me, this is really about, um, yeah, there have been some big dreams and um, 
I, I think we are wise to, uh, as Member Staunton said, explore. We're wise to get educated before we make any uh, significant decisions one way or the other. And this enables us to, to continue to, to do that. Uh, so I think that's the right thing to do at this stage. My only uh, tag along comment, I guess, would be that um, we've been working with MnDOT, talking about this issue, uh, doing many of the things that are memorialized in this non-binding memorandum of understanding. And I, th I think for purposes of kind of moving forward together to see if this makes sense uh, to the next phase before we get to any point where there's uh, you know, public input, potential public input, or the need for potential public input. Um, having an MOU, a written MOU, is, is, is a good thing. And, and I like the way the language is couched uh, in terms of its uh, non-binding nature, but it does reflect the, the goals and purposes that we both have in seeing if this makes sense uh, over the long run. So I also support it. Uh, do we have a motion with regard to the matter? So moved. Second. We had a motion second to uh, uh, execute, uh, enter into the memorandum of understanding with the Minnesota Department of Transportation uh, in the form shown uh, with, in the document that's attached uh, to our agenda. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Mr. Latoya, thank you as well for coming tonight. Andrew, we really appreciate you taking the time to come over. Thank you. Any quick report out on 169, Andrew? Everything working okay? Yes, it is. All right, good. Nice to hear. All right, uh, next matter we have in front of us this evening is um, resolution 2018 42, accepting various donations. As folks know, we can't accept donations uh, on behalf of the city of Edina without a four-fifths vote. Um, we've got some proposed donations here to Edina Park and Rec Department, uh, donations in kind, and then we have um, uh, Nine Mile Creek Watershed District grant of 18750 for buckthorn removal, and then also a donation from Kelly Lewis for $375 for a memorial tree at Weber Park. Nice. Do we have a motion with regard to this matter? So moved. Second. second. We get a motion second to accept these donations embodied in resolution 2018-42 on behalf of the city of Edina. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. All right. Uh, correspondence of petitions. Manager Neal, anything other than what, anything come in nope. during the time we've been there up here on the dais? All right. Uh, aviation noise update, Member Brindle, we uh, had a conversation this morning with Congressman Ellison. We did. And you gave him a good update, I thought, on aviation noise. Oh, thank you. A uh, couple things. Um, the FAA was funded for the next five years, so it remains a public agency. Uh, there has been um, some lobby. There have been some lobbying efforts to uh, push for privatizing the FAA, and so um, so it will remain public for at least the next five years. Uh, then um, we talked about the MD 80s and 90s, and. Uh, I heard, from, I, I heard from a resident who wants to buy a house. And, uh, and I've heard from a couple. And so what we do is we go to the macnoise.com website where all the complaints are mapped. And they tell me where they want to buy a house. And I, well, actually, I, I take them. I, nav I help them on their own computer navigate to the same graphic. And it shows where all the complaints originate over a particular month. You can see month by month or a year at a, a, at a glance. And, and I can say, well, here's where you're thinking of buying a house, and there are no complaints for the neighborhood. And so uh, that's, it's an interesting new question in the last couple of months now about people looking at where they want to be, understanding that aviation noise is here, and how prevalent is it in the neighborhood they're thinking about. Um, 
Then we've gotten a couple of complaints reason, recently about early and late flights. And, um, and we, we do notice these. And uh, then I, what I do ask is, tell me a date and time. And um, so that sometimes <coughs> you can hear a flight 90 seconds later, you can hear another flight a minute later, you can hear another flight, and it just seems like, wow, you know, is this ever going to end? Um, so we kind of we look at, all right, this was happening in Edina during this period of time. Where was it in the days before? Where is it in the days following? Because uh, we feel like um, our system is working if everyone shares a piece of the noise. So no one community is being overburdened. Um, that's not a, not a lot of consolation for people who get up early because at 5.30 in the morning, the jumbo jet is going by, and it's very loud, and I do know that sound. Uh, but um, but it is, it, it's a conversation that goes both ways, and um, so they, they talk to me about their concerns, and then I ask them for more data about just specifically what they're talking about because if there's an airplane that goes over right now at 25 minutes to nine, then we can watch that 20 minutes from now that will show up on the map and we'll be able to say, oh, this is what it was. So if there's a lag in time uh, between when that flight goes over and when it appears on the flight track map but you will know which airliner it is. You'll know who's operating it. And um, it'll give you a pretty good idea whether it's cargo or, or passenger. But, um, but the data on the macnoise.com site, it's M-A-C-N-O-I-S-E.com, is detailed. If you're a data junkie, you will have, you'll have a lot of stuff to look at on that website. But, uh, but it is a place that will answer a lot of questions or give, at least give some, um, some breadth of understanding of what, what information is out there and how to use it. Good. Thank you. Manager Neal, any follow-on to Member Mendel? I think that's it. All right, good. I, c I can just do a quick one, too. I was at a greater MSP partner meeting last week, and then uh, Brian Ricks, who's... Uh, mm -hmm. Manager at the airport uh, at the Mac. At the, you know, at the, well, at the Mac, right? Uh, we had this conversation about aircraft. He said all the MD-80s are now gone, mm -hmm. and uh, MD-90s are being phased out. Uh, MD-80s have been replaced with new Airbus planes, and so yeah. we should see a diminishment in, in noise just by virtue of having the MD-80s gone. And when the MD-90s are gone, we should be. It should be very helpful as yeah, well. Yeah, the utility airplane, the utility uh, aircraft is the Airbus 320 for longer flights. Otherwise, it's the bombardiers and in, in the Endeavors for shorter flights, and they're all with quiet kits. Good. All right. Uh, Mayor and Council comments. Uh, Member Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> the last few weeks have been busy. Uh, I attended on uh, Wednesday the 18th uh, a meeting in this room of the Board of Appeals and Equalization. Uh, for uh, This is where uh, homeowners who feel that their assessment is too high uh, have had a chance to um, appeal. And I believe tomorrow night will be the, um, the follow-on meeting where the decisions are announced from the board. Um, on Thursday, April 19th, attended the annual meeting for Metro Cities. Um, we've had some, a uh, uh, few people that have served on that board have stepped down, and we've had a few new people uh, chosen to uh, be on the board, and it's, uh, it really is a strong working group and, uh, and does a good job, I think, of helping to represent the interests of Edina and all other metropolitan area communities. Um, on Friday, April 20th, the mayor and I visited uh, Kinderberry Hill on 70th Street and uh, visited with the preschool children there. Um, 
what a, a nice uh, theme that the teachers there were putting forward to talk about community and participating in the community. Uh, so we had a chance to go over there and see that. On uh, Saturday the 21st, all of us participated in a town hall meeting. Um, it was well attended. It was over at Braemar, and, and uh, we had some really nice questions. Uh, nice questions, difficult questions, but we had a lot of questions, a lot of interest about many different topics in our city. Uh, actually took, uh, went a little bit over time, but um, uh, touched on a whole lot of topics in a pretty short period of time, so it was, uh, it was good. Um, and then uh, the 23rd, we had a recognition event for people who volunteer in our community. Uh, which uh, always blows me away, the, the talent, the, the uh, generosity of the people in our community to, uh, uh, to step forward and to do things to just make Edina and make the greater metro area a better place to be for, uh, for lots of others. So uh, a lot of selflessness and a lot of people who impress me with their um, volunteer work. Uh, then this uh, past Wednesday, May 20, or April 25th, uh, Member Brindle and the mayor and I attended a groundbreaking at uh, Nolan Mains, uh, which is the name now being used for the new development at Market Street, um, uh, just north of 50th in France. And uh, gosh, it's, it's changing fast. Uh, they, they're doing a lot, but uh, it's... It, uh, uh, it, it's, I think, really a remarkable project that's going forward. Uh, I believe they're more or less on schedule and, and very pleased to see what's going on there. Um, we had, uh, as we do on the second and fourth Thursday mornings, we had our HRA meeting on this past April, 26, this past Thursday. Um, and then on uh, Friday the 27th, uh, Member Brindle and the mayor and I attended an Arbor Day event at Garden Park uh, where we were able to help plant four trees uh, for the city of Edina. We've got um, the city, uh, our, we have a fantastic staff in every area, but we have an arborist, we have uh, people in public works. Uh, they really know what they're doing with respect to trees and, and care for our trees. And uh, we've got a, a wonderful uh, set of resources here in the city, and it's great to see them continuing to care for it. So looking ahead, some of the things that are coming up, as I mentioned, the Board of Appeals and Equalization uh, outcomes will be tomorrow night at 5.30 here. Um, this uh, Thursday, two days from now, uh, a couple of things going on. Uh, Taste of Edina will be at the Westin at 4.30 in the afternoon, and a comprehensive plan update uh, for Edina will be held at the Public Works Building. Um, it says from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Is that an open house format? Yes. Okay. So open house from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock on Thursday at the Public Works Building. Um, one of the things, uh, Member Brindle and I will soon be beginning the interviews of our uh, high school students who want to serve on our boards and commissions as our youth commissioners. And I encourage... Um, any families, uh, if you've got neighbors, grandchildren, doesn't matter. Uh, people who know uh, some young people who might have an interest in serving on uh, various of our boards and commissions, whether it's the Health Commission or the Arts and Culture Commission or the uh, Human Rights and Relations Commission or the Planning Commission. Uh, we've got a number of commissions and, and we have uh, really value the input of our uh, some of the younger members of our community. They really help us uh, think things through and think about the future, uh, which is certainly one of the things we ought to be thinking about as we contemplate some of the issues that confront our commissions. Um, there are going to be two opportunities for getting an update on the work at Arden Park. Uh, Saturday, May 5th at 10 o'clock in the morning at Arden Park. Uh, they're going to be uh, updating on the progress there. Or alternatively, uh, Tuesday, May 8th, here at City Hall from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock uh, be a chance to get updated on Arden Park. And then um, on Sunday, May 6th, we will have our annual Days of Remembrance um, event put on by our Human Rights and, Resources, uh, Human Rights and Relations Commission, uh, which will be here at City Hall. 
Uh, I've been to this a number of times. It's it's always a powerful um, event, and and there we got remarkable people on our human rights commission who uh, who do a great job putting that forward. So that's all. Yeah. Thank you. That was a lot of activity. Member Brindle. Thank you. A couple of things. Um, an email that came across today. Thank you. Uh, Corridors of Commerce is one funding source for highway money. And the 35W-494 interchange uh, had an application in for funding. And uh, 70 million out of Corridors of Commerce will be dedicated to 35W-494. It will nearly pay for phase one. Uh, phase one is a little over 80 million. So um, hope Hopefully there is more funding down the road for the rest of the project, but uh, but phase one will will certainly be a huge help. I believe that is the flyover that goes from South 35 to West 9494, and that that will just be an enormous help. But um, but that is uh, that is the first success in um, in funding that project. Uh, let's see here. I th had breakfast the other day with Ann Swenson. She said to say hello to everybody. And Mary Kay McNee, and we talked about affordable housing. It was a great conversation. I look forward to more of them. Um, and it's a really good way to get a, get a, a better perspective about just the technicalities and the inner workings of how to make affordable housing work. Um, the heavy lift and the very difficult aspect of it is single family homes. Um, and so I don't give up very easily, so I will probably keep talking about that to see if what kind of headway we can make on that. But, um, but it, we, had a, we had a great conversation. Um, and then I have a question for Director Teague. Um, this is something that I brought up when we were talking about the Estelle, and we had a very specific comprehensive plan amendment we were considering at that meeting. Um, but looking at the, the challenge that we have with projects that require a comprehensive plan amendment and the likelihood that these projects would be uh, would be a PUD. Um, is there any way to take a look at, for instance, the west side of France and rezone that now without a project, but just to rezone it now? so that project by project, parcel by parcel, you wouldn't have to seek individual comprehensive plan amendments. It's so cumbersome, and it is what is gonna really bog us down after July 30th. So is there any way to take any action now that makes it easier for projects to take place if we rezone that area to be more flexible now. I have no idea the answer of this. I'm just sort of thinking about how can we do this? Uh, member, member Brindle, members of the city council, I believe while well, we're, we're approaching that June 30th deadline a couple of ways, the first action that the council took as, a res as part of the, uh, the Hazelden Apartments where height was not removed from the comprehensive plan. We still have those height guidelines, but we added that flexibility language that allows you to approve height greater than what's suggested in the comprehensive plan through a PUD or through a variance. So we don't have the height issue to wrestle with anymore. The next step of that is coming as part of a redevelopment project that's uh, proposed at 7250 France Avenue, that's the Dean DeVolis uh, project, that will be on your next agenda. And uh, it was recommended for <laughs> approval by the Planning Commission, but that would increase the density up to 80 units an acre. So the, the base <coughs> is still uh, 12 units to 30 units an acre. 
Um, however, in that whole district along the west side of France, the council can increase the density up to 80 units an acre, again, through PUD or some type of a, a rezoning action. So I think the combination of those two, those two actions will take care of our comprehensive plan issues with June 30th. Um, also, even though those are specific to two parcels, <laughs> those are not parcel specific. It's for that the whole west side of France. Really? That whole area okay. is guided okay. office residential. Correct. Great. Great. The Met Council is also considering on May 7th extending that June 30th deadline to December 31st. So we Ooh. we may not have that issue. Okay. All right. Well, and so I'm happy to know that the flexibility is there by having these two projects come through. Okay, terrific, thank you. Uh, that's what I have. Okay, good, thank you. Member Stoughton, welcome home. Thank you, nothing from me. All right, a um, few things for me. Uh, on the uh, 19th of um, April, when uh, Member Stewart was over at the Oh, over at the Metro City's annual meeting, uh, Member Staunton and I were at the TEDx uh, evaluation session at the FIC, and that was a really enjoyable night. Uh, so many of the people there were so uh, competent and self-assured, it was really a pleasure to watch them sort of compete to be in the actual TEDx competition that's coming up in uh, October. Uh, earlier that day, uh, I was a, a participant in the Affordable Housing Summit Mayor's Forum uh, downtown at the uh, Marriott, the mayors of Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth were the other members of that panel. And that was a, a real interesting uh, session as well, about 400 people in attendance there. Um, then on the 20th, uh, Member Stewart mentioned we were at Kinderbury Hill. Member Stewart was a great uh, book prompter and book holder for Duck, for what was it? Duck for President was the book that uh, that he read to the kids, and they had a lot of questions. And it was a business casual day at Kinderbury Hill, and I think four or five of the boys had uh, their interpretation of business casual was was uh, neckties. So they had <laughs> clip-on ties or bow ties on, and some of them had them down at the second or third button down, and they just didn't want them up around their necks. So it was it was a it was a great outing. Um, 21st, before the town hall meeting, we had walk with the mayor and uh, had a good group of folks show up there, um, including a group from the uh, Art and Art Center uh, that wanted to visit about a few things that were of concern to them. Uh, on the um, 25th, let's see, I'm trying to catch my dates here. The 25th, uh, several of the mayors met with um, Governor Dayton on metropolitan governance and expressed our uh, uh, concerns about some of the one of the bills that's in in front of the legislature, uh, sponsored by Representative Tony Albright uh, and Senator Eric Pratt from uh, the Prior Lake area, and um, so that was a productive meeting as well. Uh, and then uh, had a Greater MSP Partnership Advisory meeting on the 26th of April. Uh, that's where I ran into Brian Ricks. And then on the 27th. Um, after the Arbor Day tree planting, uh, I drove up to Purim for the Minnesota Mayor's Conference. There were about 80 mayors that showed up there. And I was part of a panel on Friday night on the urban-rural divide. As all of you know, we've had some urban mayors going out into greater Minnesota. First trip was October, went to Bemidji. Uh, December, we were in uh, Duluth. And then we had a chance to talk to a bigger group of mayors about the things that we were working on. It was moderated by... Uh, Rita Albright, who was the mayor of um, of, um, of Bemidji, uh, and uh, then the participants on the panel, along with me, were Molly Cummings from Hopkins, the other urban mayor, uh, and then we had Mayor of Thief River Falls, uh, and um, who else did we have? Mayor of Fergus Falls, and uh, those were two of the participants in our first meeting up in Bemidji, and we had a great conversation. And then let's see, um, Member Stewart, thank you for mentioning uh, Days of Remembrance coming up on the 6th. That's at 1 o'clock here at City Hall. Uh, the day before is uh, Highway Cleanup, if you're interested in coming down and helping all of us on the Rotary on Highway Cleanup. 
and uh, then the, that Arden Park meeting, and then uh, the Adina Youth Climate Summit is at one o'clock uh, at the high school on the uh, 5th of May as well. And then uh, last night, uh, we had history made in Edina. Uh, the first uh, young girls uh, became members of uh, a Cub Scout troop. Uh, they became Bobcats. And so it was uh, history in the making. Um, Cub Scouts was formed in 1930. And so in 2018, 88 years later, girls are now part of Cub Scout packs. And uh, it was a great group of young women. And uh, I've got some photos I'll share with the council at another time. And we did it over in the historic Grange Hall, so they got to hear about Sarah Baird as a, a leading uh, voice, not only for women, but for our community uh, in the Grange. So that was a, a wonderful meeting over there. Uh, and then this morning, uh, some of us met with uh, Representative Ellison on a variety of topics. Uh, that included uh, aviation noise, member Brindle touched on that, transportation, uh, net neutrality, and um, I did have a call from uh, Comcast that wanted to voice their uh, position on net neutrality, and I think it's coming up in front of the U.S. Conference of Mayors in June, uh, that meeting I'll be attending. So I said we'd, we'd put this off. I don't think there's any immediacy to the issue. I just want to make sure, and I know everybody in this council feels the same. We want to hear all points of view before we make a decision on net neutrality. We talked a little bit about preemption issues, some of the issues we're facing at the state legislature. Uh, as Member Staunton says, there's folks over there that like local control until they don't. And uh, we want to make sure that we're aware of that at the, uh, uh, at the, that he was aware of that at the federal level as well, if they see any preemption issues coming. Uh, Manager Neal talked to him about maintaining a retail post office presence at 50th and France. Uh, Congress people are influential on that issue. We also talked about the MPO status for the Met Council uh, and affordable housing and a few other issues. So um, it was a productive meeting, I think, uh, this morning with uh, uh, the Congressman. Uh, and we appreciate Congressman Ellison coming over to Edina and, and meeting with us every year. And uh, I think that uh, wraps it up for me, Manager Neal. Thank you, Your Honor. I have one item on my report, and it's an item that uh, that we that you and I had uh, discussed very briefly after the last HRA meeting, and that was to uh, have a little bit of check-in, I think, with the council to find out how uh, you think it has gone so far uh, with our new HRA meeting schedule. Um, as you remember, we 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 set this policy up, or we set this new meeting calendar up for this year. Second and fourth Thursdays, 7.30 to 9.30 a.m. It's been a, quite a while since the council has had uh, scheduled public meetings at 7.30, but we have done that in the past. And there, uh, as, as the mayor and I discussed, uh, the question, there's a couple questions. Do we need two meetings a month? Um, do we need to continue in a morning setting or is an evening, uh, is an evening preferable? But maybe even more important was the, the second and fourth uh, weeks as opposed to first and third, uh, because it, it does have the impact of, of kind of crowding out uh, your opportunity to have any kind of travel uh, without having to miss a, an official public meeting of some kind, because we've got one scheduled in essentially every week, except with the exception of fifth weeks of the year, which there are a few of them, but not very many. So that is a question we, we just wanted to get some input from council members uh, tonight I can tell you uh, as a practical matter your your HRE meeting schedule until the end of June is pretty full at this point and it would be it would be it would cause some practical difficulties to change it um, you've got some projects that are working their way to you on the HRA side and at the council side uh, that really are going to require uh, require some time uh, I can tell you from a personal standpoint, I think that our, I think our meeting discussions are, are more thoughtful and fruitful at 7.30 a.m. than at 11.30 p.m. Um, but that's, that's my opinion, and I don't know if that's shared by everyone on the council. But. Yeah, right. Thank you for those uh, comprehensive comments. Uh, after the last meeting, I was visiting with Manager Neal about it, and I was thinking, that it, we're now meeting essentially every week of the month. 
And um, it, it caused me to think about whether or not we should try to consolidate the work of the HRA with some advance notice if we could start in July, for example, maybe doing it the second uh, Thursday of the month and not the fourth, but and then do it at like 5 or 5.30 in the evening instead of in the morning, because I know at like our last meeting, I think by the time I got to work, it was close to 10 o'clock in the morning. And, and for mm -hmm. me personally, it's easier to come at 5 or 5.30 in the evening and then work into the evening than it is to try to cut some of the heart out of the morning. And I don't know how it is for the rest of you, but, uh, and then also the factor of uh, when, you're, when you're working every week of the month, you cannot really go anywhere. At least, you know, you feel like you can't go anywhere. We, we've had to, be, we've had some travel that we've had to uh, participate in and miss a meeting. And I think all of us hate missing meetings, but nonetheless, sometimes your other schedules take precedence yeah. and you, have to, you just have to go and miss a meeting. So I, I thought it was worthwhile talking about uh, understanding that through June, we're gonna be busy and probably need to stay on that two meetings uh, per month schedule. Yeah, that's what I mean. um, but maybe in July we can we can change things around and and, and go to once a month meetings and and start. By, I'm flexible in morning versus evening too, I guess. But I want to at least get some of your other thoughts now that we've been doing this for uh, a few months. If if other council members have thoughts about modifying that schedule that we set up, I do. Members, Don. Um, so I I like had separate meetings. I think they are having a beneficial effect on the length of our meetings, notwithstanding the fact that we managed to make this meeting go for two hours. I don't know possibly how we could have done that, but, <laughs> um, but I, I do think it's good to do them. Um, I like the morning, but I appreciate that if that doesn't work for others, that doesn't work for others. I. I I mean, there's there's um, there's problems either way. If you do them if you do them the same week as a meeting, then it feels like that's a lot in one week. On the other hand, the mayor makes a good point. We've each had to miss sometimes, and maybe that's what happens. Um, my inclination would be whenever we end up scheduling them, to, I, I'd like to keep them separate from the council meeting nights, and I'd like to keep two scheduled. And if we get to a, you know. We end up don't not needing a second one in a month. We can just not have it. But I, I worry that I think we have enough on our plate that if we don't do them, then the other meetings just get longer. And and the longer the meetings go, I think the harder it is for us to be engaged. Member Stewart. Thank you. I like the morning meetings only because we uh, we give up a lot of evenings as it is, and uh, it's hard to give up all of them. <laughs> so, um, having said that, um, if you know we've scheduled these to be from 7:30 until 9 o'clock, I think it'd be good if we can find a way to know that we really genuinely can end at 9 o'clock. Um, rather than uh, having it, as you said, drag out so you, it's 10 o'clock before you can get to your business. Um, I do have a standing meeting on the first Thursday of every month, so it'd be very hard for me to um, do first and third. Um, but I, yeah, yeah the idea of traveling, uh, it, it becomes daunting. There's no time ever when you can leave without missing something. So um, anyway, I, uh, we've been filling the hour and a half s that we had scheduled so far. So I, I, I wouldn't want to suggest that we do morning meetings scheduled for an hour and a half and try to fit everything in only once a month. Okay. I, don't, I don't think that will work. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm open to other ways of approaching the issue. I'm open to, to accommodating other people's schedules as much as I can. Uh, but I, I have my own schedule constraints, and I hope people will help accommodate those, too. Thank you. Member Brindle. Thank you. Um, I like the two meetings a month. I, I agree with Kevin. If, if we end up not needing one, then we just 
don't need that one. But uh, the pace that we are moving at um, is such that I think we do need two meetings a month. And um, I do see the day where we may, we may just, uh, as we kind of have, I think, but really dedicate one toward affordable housing as that new position and the relationship with the Edina Housing Foundation is, is formalized. Um, there's, there's a lot to talk about with regard to affordable housing, and we have a limited amount of time to use some of that funding. And so it really does become a priority to make sure that we have the time we need to not be rushing at the last minute. Um, that said, I am going to miss May 10th because I've had something on the calendar for a long time and I've tried to move it and I can't move it. So I am going to miss May 10th. But I, um, I don't see that I'm going to have a conflict beyond that. Uh, so I wouldn't move it for me. Um, I think the second and fourth will work fine. Uh, I do, um, I do agree that when you're trying to plan, whether it's personal or professional, that you need to get away, that's, that's tough. And maybe that's what causes a meeting to be shifted or canceled, is just the fact that there's a period of time where it's just not going to work. But, um, but I guess, let's, as you say, you've got it set through the end of June, and you've got agendas forming through that time. So if we make an adjustment, um, I'm fine with morning or evening. I can make evening work. Um, I sort of think we have a stop time if it's morning, and we don't have a stop time if it's evening. So I think we can be more diligent and more disciplined if it's morning, and we know that, all right, Nine o'clock, we're done. We're done with our stuff. And if there's an extenuating circumstance, hopefully it's rare, but, uh, but I do think that's a benefit of the morning, is that we have a stop time. One of the things we've done at the um, tab is that we've tried to anticipate uh, summertime activity from people and their families. Oh. And I'm sitting here thinking that um, we should keep it in the mornings. We should keep our present mm -hmm. schedule of the second and fourth Thursdays. I like... You can, get out of town. you can get out of town for a weekend and even take Thursday if you want to. So. Yeah. So, so, you know, maybe in July and August, we could manage, we're far enough out where we could manage our schedules, so maybe we would, we would only have one meeting um, if, people want to, if people are going to travel and take a week off. Right, you have one council meeting in July. That's already on the calendar instead of two. Mm -hmm. So that's, that might be one way okay. to accommodate some of, the, some of the travel people want to take. You know, this, this past week, uh, the HRA meeting, we had a couple of folks missing because they just had other things they had to do that were on their calendar. Yeah. And that doesn't usually happen for a council meeting. Um, really, would we have two missing? But it can happen. So I guess, based on what I've heard from my colleagues, uh, stick with the uh, stay of the course and maybe look, uh, staff look at July and August as a place where we can not only accommodate you know HRA members, but staff members as well. I mean, we're not the only ones that think right. about uh, time off. So it might make it easier for people that are actively engaged with the HRA from a staff standpoint to be able to do some planning as well. I, I did talk to uh, Councilmember Fisher earlier today, and this that kind of fits in generally with what his preferences were as well. Okay. All right. Good. All right. And that's it. Does that cause anything else for anyone? Did anyone think of anything new they wanted to add? No, just another congratulations to Officer Brian Hubbard. That was just right. really nice. Oh, thanks. All right, we stand adjourned. <laughs>